Uh, it's it almost reads out of the script of a Hollywood movie. I, I don't think you'd, you could write the script for what happened in this job. It was intriguing, this case, right, right from the start. It was intriguing. Just the background of Eric's life was, was just completely engrossing. I thought he was a genuine guy. I had no reason to be that for him. Continuation of a record of you being conducted at Nursa Head Police Station. Just tell us from the start, what, what do you know of this matter? I meet some people and have no money to survive, and they offer me some kind of business to go to South America. They loaded the ship with 20 kilograms of cocaine there. 20 kilos? Yeah. Who are these people you talking about? Who are they? Mafia. Okay. What? what which one? Russia, Poland. Uh... And according to Eric, he had quite a, an outstanding drug debt. And uh, on the way back, I was so afraid, and I just said, I don't want to do it. As he's stopping over in Amsterdam, he gets cold feet. He claims that he dumped the drugs. I went back to my home in Poland. They beat me up, they broke my finger, cut my ear. Is it because you didn't do the job? Because I didn't, I didn't bring that cocaine to Poland. Mm -hmm. So I was so afraid. And they told me I gotta go back and do another trip, but to Thailand. So Eric claims that he gets cold feet again and thinks, well, bugger this, <laughs> I'm going to Australia. How much do they think that you owe them? They said to me that was cost two million dollars. So that's how much they reckon you owe them? Yeah. I'd like to think that um, some of what Eric has said is is true, and that it's a it's a story of you know sadness of, of drug usage and in desperation, but I think, uh, I think Eric's just a thief. On the 17th of November, 1999, $3 million worth of rare jewelry, precious stones, paintings, money, and a luxury boat were stolen from the lavish home of one of the Gold Coast's most prominent couples. It was one of the biggest and most blatant robberies in Gold Coast history. Ian and Beverly Dorr never saw it coming. We'd arranged to have dinner at the casino, so we didn't get home till 12 o'clock at night. Well, Ian just dropped me at the front gate and the dog ran out, hopped in the car, and off he went for the walk. I went inside and uh, went upstairs and I uh, had a shower, got ready for bed, and then I went over to a chest of drawers by the bed where I kept my jewellery, and the jewellery that I had on, I was taking off to put in the drawer. And when I opened this big drawer, there was nothing there. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And then I thought, well, what else has happened? So I better go and tell Ian. So I went downstairs, and he wasn't back. And I don't know what made me go and have a look to see if the boat was still on the jetty. It was just one of those silly things. But I went and switched the lights on and it was just pitch black. There was nothing there. So by the time I'd discovered that and I walked out to the front, Ian was arriving back with the dog. Yeah, round the back. Ian! What? What? They have a software company on the side. And I thought, no, I better check what's going on there. Because it was an international little business we had. No computer. It's gone. Uh, police, police, police. Call the police. So I ran over to the guards and said, we've been robbed, somebody's pinched my computer. I come back, Bev comes running over and saying, the boat's been stolen. Look. Oh, Jesus. There's this paintings man. not on the wall. Oh, I can which paintings are gone? Oh. Which one? Look at the whole the gaps in the walls where fine art was stolen. Oh my God, Father, by this time the guards had called the police. It was when they were there that we went into the garage because I had looked in the garage and I found that the safe had been broken into. I said, oh my God, those, those pinched, pinched dormant contents of the safe. The Dawes home on Sovereign Island was one of the most exclusive and secure addresses on the Gold Coast but they'd just become the victims of a crime as mysterious as it was costly. 
at 6.30 in the morning. Police from the night shift handed the case over to Detective Hindmarsh and Detective Village. Little did they know, this was the start of a manhunt that would cover the world and consume their lives for over a year. Unfortunately, a burglary is quite a run-of-the-mill job, but it quickly became apparent that this was something far above and beyond a typical burglary. It was a real mystery from, from day one. The, the crime scene management had already been put in place when Jason and I arrived. The investigators from the night crew um, had just given us the highlights that property value was then still to be determined, but we had a luxury vessel, luxury artwork, jewellery, and still a list of other items that hadn't been located. There was hundreds of thousands in fine art, big quantity of jewellery, um, diamonds, rubies, valuable original banknotes, a huge number of sovereigns. And, you know, I put a lot of money into that sort of area for retirement. <laughs> what a joke that was. <laughs> we had our forensic officers come into an examination of the scene for fingerprints. DNA didn't really exist in the late 90s. It was just, just starting. Um, we canvassed the neighbourhood, speaking to neighbours to see what they'd seen. Uh, we were fortunate that this crime scene was on a quite an exclusive um, residence on a man-made island with uh, entry that was covered by CCTV. Um, even back in the 1990s, the residences were valued multi-million dollar residences. It was time critical, a boat's missing, um, substantial amount of dollar value on the, um, the property that was alleged to have been stolen at the time. And we had a very distressed husband and wife being the victims. Well, what was going through my Where the hell is all this wealth gone? I mean, it was a big robbery. The island itself, uh, Sovereign Island, had a private security company. So again, with them, we um, analysed the CCTV footage, spoke to the uh, security officer who was on frosted on that night to see if he'd seen anything out of the ordinary. Being a gated community, everyone knows everyone on the island. One of the witnesses, um, we took a statement off later that day, he, um, he can recall waving to um, an unknown male he assumed was Ian on, on his boat as it motored away from um, Ian's property. And he was somewhat offended that Ian didn't wave back to him. There was no forced entry to the house. There was forced entry to the safe within the house. So it was someone who had access to the house. Well, I thought it could only be Eric that could have done it because he's the only one that really had access to the house. But I still didn't believe it and I was still hesitant, you know, to think that it would have been him. Eric Sokolowski was the Polish handyman the Doors had recently taken under their wing. They were overwhelmed by the that their trust had been betrayed, um, whether they were naive. Um, there's all, you know, people have different opinions about, uh, you know, how they did their hiring of, of um, Eric, but um, it was quite evident that they were, they were showing some genuine emotions. I thought he was a genuine guy, starting to settle down on the Gold Coast. He was living with this Vietnamese lady and he wanted to stay in Australia. For, for us is the detectives at Surface Paradise. This was our patch. This person had taken all this property and all this um, money that this hard-working Australian had been like collecting and, and, and securing in his own place for his retirement with his wife. And then all of a sudden this bloke's come along and just taken it. And, and not just taken it, but taken it so brazenly. It looked clear to us that whoever um, had taken this property, knew where to go, or very quickly after getting in there, worked it out, and had the time to stay there. Luxury of time to Jimmy open a safe. Like I think the doors left 6 a.m. on day one and went back till midnight the following day. There was a, a big window there. And the only person suspiciously absent was Eric. Security system deactivated, Gold Coast stockbroker Ian Dawes' canal front home was stripped. Two million dollars worth of jewels and original artwork had vanished. His luxury cruiser was gone, so was the gardener. I had to get 
somebody to look after the garden in particular. So um, by pure chance, we get a leaflet in the letterbox by this fellow from Kosselin or from Poland. And we thought, I said to Bev, I said, oh, look, we've got to get somebody I need. I need somebody to help us with the, the outside and da 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 And um, so I said, I think we'd better interview this guy. Anyway, he came along, clean cut, good looking bloke, young, about 25, and said, look, I used to work on, on boats and I painted houses in America and buildings and so on. I said, have you been painting? I said, we've got to have the pa house painted. I said, I've already had a quote, um, but I said, look, if you do the right thing by us, I might get you to paint our house and put the other fella off. If you do it for the same price, I'd rather help you as a, to get you established on the Gold Coast. And I'll help you with referrals to other residents of Sovereign Island. Anyway, he convinced me that he could do the job, and he did. It's just you and your wife living here? Just, yeah, just me and my wife. A letterbox drop, in my opinion, wasn't the way you employed anybody. <laughs> I was a little bit against that, but um, seeing as that was Ian's department, you know, I had to agree with it. And he was around for about two or three months before I actually met him. And I just didn't like the way he moved around the place. He would just have these blue eyes that pierce through the <laughs> windows and that looking at you, you know, and it just made me feel uncomfortable. I, and I said, I just kept on saying to him, be careful with him, be careful. Well, I found him quite a, so, so, so quite a decent guy. I mean, well, I thought so, you know, I mean, bear in mind, we were working long hours. I mean, we'd be in the office at seven o'clock if we were working Sydney time. And we wouldn't get home sometimes till eight o'clock at night, because I rarely saw him during the day. Quite frankly, he, he had access to the house. I trusted him. Simple. It was pretty obvious very early on that Eric was our, our person of interest. So the first thing was getting that vessel, so getting the North Point. We notified um, through the Water Police shipping channels, shipping companies. We, we got everything we could out into the public forum as quick as we could. The exclusive canal estate of the Sovereign Islands highly secure but not when you have the key. The owners reported their luxury boat missing along with two million dollars worth of art, jewellery and furniture. The boat is equipped to travel overseas but would need to refuel. Police have issued a port alert throughout Queensland and New South Wales. The problem was we didn't have a, um, any idea where the boat was going. With Eric's background he was from um, mainland Europe. We had connections to him in Thailand but otherwise we had a boat motoring out of the um, Southport Seaway, um, heading east from Australia. The ocean is it's a massive place to start looking, and he had quite a head start on us too before we could um, get those broadcasts out to the public. An aerial search for the boat began at first light this morning. The 15-metre custom-made bay cruiser called North Point was last seen yesterday afternoon heading out of the canal. In the beginning, it's, it's collecting as much information at first, sifting through it, and to seeing where the facts and evidence fall. He was only ever intercepted once, and that was the day of the offence, as he was preparing to commit the offence. And this is the actual audio recording of Eric when the police stopped him that day. There you go. All right, then. How many are you police? You heard of the stop sign there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you got a driver's licence there at all? What type of licence do you have? Uh, it's an uh, international uh, bomb. Do you have that international license on you? No. Why not? And of course the coppers didn't, don't know what he's doing, he's just a bloke in the car. So, you know, he hasn't got like a mound of treasure in the back of the car or anything at the time. He's going back and forth his house and, and, and the uh, fence location. Please give us a notice to go through the stop sign. What police didn't know was that Eric was doing a fuel run. That day, he made 15 fuel trips to the boat, giving it a range of well over a thousand kilometres. So the timeline was starting to firm up around Eric's movements. And then Eric had his girlfriend that he lived with, and she obviously was someone that we reached out to straight away. Sure, come in. Thank you. Eric had met Karen at a nightclub, and the pair had been living together for six months. Karen shows this 
handwritten note reportedly left by Eric, leaving her a car and a bank card in his name with a pin number. And it says that he's gone off to Poland to find his son. Um, and she was pregnant to Eric at the time. So obviously she was very distressed around that. But again, a new, a new avenue of inquiry, a new potential, potential witness, but also potentially a new suspect. At the, at the start, I think she was um, honestly surprised by what had happened. She had a very, very limited knowledge of Eric and his background. We knew, according to Karen, he was a former member of the Polish, Polish um, armed forces. Um, he'd given stories to Karen about being, you know, hunted by the uh, Russian mafia. But again, you put this in perspective of Eric and all his manipulating, we, we couldn't believe very little of it. So as Eric was motoring out to sea with a multi-million dollar haul, the doors and the investigating team were searching closer to home. So we focused on areas where, with, with fuel, or he could have made it to. Ian quickly uh, gained the assistance of friends, associates, work colleagues, uh, members of the Rotary Group he was a member of. He chartered helicopters, light air aircraft. Um, he had friends on jet skis and boats, searching coastal regions throughout northern New South Wales and Queensland. Because um, Ian was a successful stockbroker and with his own company, he had obviously a, a business personality um, where he expected that if he wanted to offer a Queensland police the help, um, the Queensland police would take that help. There was an education process for all <laughs> on both parts. Um, I was so betrayed uh, that I just had to go from, couldn't stop at anything. <clears throat> it cost me 10 grand just to get the bloody plane to look for. But after eight days, the search found nothing. From everything we could see, Eric had just cut all ties and left the country. He could have been anywhere in the world. There was a net strong element of planning because to uh, have the time to go in to get that, that the stolen property and then to sail away, thinking that a police boat or um, a helicopter is not going to be able to get you. You know, he obviously had an idea of um, you'd expect of where the route he was going to take, and um, that he had some sort of cover of darkness or or somewhere else to to uh, store the property temporarily or permanently. Yeah, we worked some really long hours in those first few weeks, and but quickly it became a stalled investigation. It really became frustrated. Um, our inquiries through Interpol overseas, we, we conducted inquiries in numerous countries, in Poland, in uh, Thailand, in the United Kingdom. And back in the 1990s, they took time for those inquiries to come back. But locally, the amount of inquiries we could do, um, they, they eventually evaporated. And it became quite frustrating, um, knowing that there was missing millions in stolen property and Eric was out there somewhere. With a boat, he had the means to travel, you know, travel anywhere in the world. We didn't know if he had assistance from overseas. Was he meeting someone else? Literally disappeared. He was like a ghost. 16 days later, Eric mysteriously appeared. 75 kilometers south of the Gold Coast, on the quiet shores of New Brighton. Jason and I were actually involved in a, another investigation on, on this particular day when um, one of our, our supervisors um, called us in and said, oh, Eric's been potentially sighted down at New Brighton. He was spotted by a property holder in a caravan on his property eating tin food. And in the words of the property owner, it was as though Eric had swum from Tahiti. He was obviously sunburnt, um, dehydrated and quite weathered. The owner confronted Eric and he bolted. But two days after arriving, he was sighted again in a local bakery. 
Uh, one of the female staff in the bakery was serving a customer. Let's have one uh, croissant and a big coffee. Who was male and when she looked at him, he just looked sunburnt and really withered, um, quite exhausted. Um, and she distinctly saw that he had a wet $5 note. And what stood out to her was the cap he was wearing and the fishing shirt this uh, male was wearing looked identical to her uncle's own um, hat and shirt. The young girl from a local family was convinced that it was the Polish thief she'd seen in the papers and rang police. But by the time they got there, he'd vanished, leaving the dinghy the only clue on the beach. And when Ian went and uh, recovered his tender from the boat, there was no doubt it was Eric, and he was in Australia, so the chase was on again. We, we, were, we felt we were getting close again. Well, it allowed us to get some very good evidence in that the, the dinghy was recovered, some forensics could be um, performed on the dinghy, um, allowed us to get an opportunity to see his potential state of mind through his physical appearance and what he's in, potentially enduring at that point. And where we've got um, a, an offender or a suspect that's desperate, then there's opportunity that they'll make a mistake. That allowed us to put some, um, some other surveillance measures around Karen for any potential contact that might come. If he's desperate, who's he gonna contact? If he knows he's wanted, so where's he gonna go next? So all these questions suddenly come again. But with the North Point still missing, Ian Dore latched onto another piece of evidence. The rubber ducky had an extra patch on it. I said, this patch is new. And it was at an angle that I can only be certain of, in my opinion, that it hit the duckboard of another boat. In fact, when the patch was taken off, there were three little cuts, no more than 10 millimetres or something like that. It could only have happened by it hitting barnacles. And I believe it hit the barnacles of the boat that went out to get Eric. Which, you know, uh, raises the, the possibilities of, um, has the main North Point been handed over and, and he's then, you know, rode to that part of the world, the part C of the plan. That's why we thought we'd better search further south. You know, the publicity was enormous. And we were getting people ringing up saying, yes, we've seen your boat. And, We'd take the aircraft and go check it out and see whether it's Dinkum and all this, because it wasn't. We had stories that the jewellery had been hidden on the hills at Brunswick Heads, in the sand hills, so that caused a flurry of people looking for them with metal detectors and so on. <laughs> all, all rubbish. While Ian was stretching his search as far south as Sydney, many theories were being discussed about where the North Point could be. Had it been sunk? had it been hidden or handed over to someone else. Either way, Ian's luxury boat had vanished. Look, for a, for a stall and frustrating investigation, this really re-energised us. It got to the stage where everyone you looked at, you had in the back of your mind, is this Eric? If we could find Eric, we could find the stolen property. So everything, every boat I looked at was a North Point, you know, in my head. Steve was very, very personally involved and he spent a lot of his own time because he had the, he had the scent, he could smell him. He knew he was there, just couldn't quite figure out where he was. The investigation gained quite a bit of publicity um, with national media and for investigators that was both a bonus and a burden. So we were inundated with um, countless false sightings of, of boats all, all around the um, eastern seaboard. But as the weeks went by, once again, the case went cold. It was a bit disheartening, man. We revisited Karen and um, revisited a lot of the records to see if any vehicles, any names similar or any little lead that um, could assist us with, you know, finding him. So, yeah, once all those were exhausted, yeah, then it's, uh, well, you know, where, where do we go now? What do we do now? At times it was, you know, I'd look out to the sea and think, oh, God, Eric, you know, how could you do this? I'm going to find you. I was just determined to get him, and I thought, I've never been so de 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 betrayed in my life about trying to help somebody. And as a Rotarian, that really got me. 
And I thought, gee, if you don't do that to me, boy, you're going to suffer. I don't care how long you've been in jail. And Ian Dool had deep enough pockets to stop at nothing. Jet skis, helicopters, boats, planes. He was leveraging off his professional relationships and friendships and his personal ones. He was definitely uh, using a lot of resources. Started, you know, local, and then he went national, um, and then he was going international with his, um, again, using his contacts. We've got to get this bloke. Sokolovsky. But in spite of the enormous effort by detectives and the doors, there were no more leads. Three million dollars worth of paintings, jewelry, and a luxury vessel were still missing, and the only one who knew where they were, Eric Sokolowski, was untraceable. My belief is that after Eric um, washed ashore in New Brighton, he touched base with Karen again. Karen would later claim that Eric arrived on her doorstep and told her of the robbery the day he took off from New Brighton. She wouldn't see him again until after the birth of their baby four months later. But what we later learned is that Eric had come into possession of stolen identification from Port Douglas and was living a new life under that identification. And Eric was using every trick he could to keep that new life hidden from police. Months had passed since the three million dollar robbery of the doors. Eric was now listed on Queensland's Most Wanted, but the investigation was struggling. It was a unique investigation as our whole focus was tracking them, find Eric. If we could find Eric, we could find the stolen property. Ian and Beverly, they, were, they had lost a small fortune from their, their nest egg, you'd call it. And we really wanted to do the right thing by Ian and try and recover his property. But like any investigation, the longer it goes, the chances of finding his property just it's almost zero by this stage. And with no new leads in the months ticking by, there was now changes on the investigation team. Detective Hindmarsh was transferred to another division, leaving Detective Illich working the case alone. But this didn't deter Ian Dorr. It just made him more dogged than ever. The first six months, I was just determined. I said, I'm going to get this guy at all costs. I don't care. I'm going to get him somehow. Well, what I did is I, said, I, I searched the world for everything that he said he'd done and tried to verify it. We would stay at the office until 10, 11 o'clock at night because office computers were more powerful than the ones we had at home. And we would be searching the world on the internet. Uh, Ian Sorry. began canvassing investigators in Poland that might help him find Eric's parents. Well, dig deeper, man. Yeah. What they found was Eric's parents' phone number. The stalled case finally had a vital lead. The thinking was trying to find any incoming calls or outgoing calls from the home phone in Poland, from his mum's home phone, um, to Australia. Because he's desperate, maybe, just maybe, he'll reach out to his family member. So Steve asked for the, the phone records of Eric's parents. Well, we didn't get one phone number. We got a series of numbers. But I knew we were on the track. And sure enough, out of the blue, very quickly, up turns this giant ream of paper of phone numbers calling the parents' address in Polish. And there were thousands and thousands of these numbers and these hundreds of pages. And then right halfway down one page, right at the back, of course, was this mobile phone number, an Australian number. And that is what set Steve on his path. That new Australian number was traced to calls made near a cell tower in Noosa. Could it be that Eric, the Polish thief, was only 220 kilometres from where he robbed the doors? Steve asked for that phone number, that Australian mobile phone number, to be checked. And the result comes back through our intelligence group of this phone number belonging to this bloke called Derek McLeod and Derek McLeod lives up in Cairns, and we're like, well, why is Derek ringing Eric's mum and dad? But then when we checked the computer system, the police computer system, 
Derek's had his wallet knocked off while he's been up in Cairns. You're thinking, well, surely that phone number was being used by Eric, who is using Derek's name. Tracing the records from this stolen phone, even more evidence began to mount. From those phone numbers, Steve identified that there was one phone number predominantly being called, and that number belonged to a girl called Kim No. Now, Steve suspects that Kim is actually Eric's girlfriend, Karen. But that's all he's got to go on. He's just got this suspicion. What police didn't know was that six months earlier, Karen had given birth to Eric's son, and they were now living together in Noosa. Reunited, this happy family had no idea that police were getting closer. Noosa's a small community, and those cell towers we could lock down to a, you know, a hundred to two hundred metre radius. So there was a lot of urgency about trying to firm up that information. But I could feel that we were close um, to some, to if not finding Eric, we were close to finding someone who was involved or associated or could give us some fresh evidence. After more than 12 months, it's the biggest breakthrough of the case. But lead detective Steve Illich has to travel overseas, forcing him to hand the investigation to Noosa born and bred detective Aaron Ottaway. And then I took the case on and, and, and I really immersed myself. So I completely spent every minute of my day on the case. And I could see that primarily the phone was, was locating in Noosa Heads. And having been a resident of Noosa Heads my entire life, I knew exactly where it, these cell towers were. He can only be in one of 12 streets just by those cell tower locations. And I had this giant map of Australia. And I had pins, just like you see in the movies, of all the locations that the phone number had been used. And I had bits of string going to what business had been called or, or what time it had been there. And, and I had pictures of Eric all the way along the wall. Every picture that we had of him and his famous scar on his ear, I had it blown up to A4 size so that I knew exactly what he looked like. I said to the boss, I said, mate, I want to go and I want to find Eric at the Sunshine Coast. And he's, well, I don't really think that, you know, he's there, but he goes, we don't really have the money for it. And I said, I'll tell you what, I said, all I need is a car and a copper. I said, I'll stay with my, my parents, with my family. And he's like, oh, all right, off you go. So I piled into a car with a mate of mine. Off we went up to Noosa, looking for it. But with no known address or confirmed sighting, the investigation was hanging by a thread. After a 405-day manhunt spanning the globe, police were finally closing in on Queensland's yeah. most wanted Holy man. Mm -hmm. Having been a resident of Noosa Heads my entire life, having played as a kid on, on the main street, Hastings Street there, and climbing the Noosa Hill, when I was looking at the cell tower locations, I was like, whoa, Hastings Street, Noosa Hill. I knew it backwards. I knew exactly where it, these cell towers were. He can only be in one of 12 streets just by those cell tower locations. So now it was a matter of tracking him down. Because even though we had this phone number, and even though we had this alias that he was using, Derek McLeod, we couldn't find him by any intelligence checks whatsoever. He wasn't renting a house under that name. He wasn't using a credit card under that name. He didn't have electricity. We did everything. And not once did Derek McLeod or this phone number pop up. So at that time, we didn't know where he actually physically was, other than in Noosa, on the side of this hill. I was sure that we were on the right track, just like Steve was sure right at the start. I had no doubt in my mind. It was just, it was uncanny that, that all these little pieces had fallen into place like this. It had, to, it had to be him. And being a detective on a case like this, you have to be very delicate with what you're doing. And you've got to remember, back then, Noosa was still a coastal town. You don't want your bad guy getting a whiff that you're there, because if he gets a whiff, he's gone. So I had to be really 
really careful. So I know this phone number has called a bunch of places. So I go to each place. I went to all the caravan parks, you know, checking Eric's real name, checking the alias Derek, checking the phone number. And on all the occasions of all the places I went to, the marina, the airport, everywhere, it was, it was coming up negative until I, uh, I decided to call the local newspaper. And that's sort of what put the ball rolling, I should, should say. I ring up the, uh, the local newspaper at the time, Sunshine Coast Daily, and, and I ask them if they've ever had an ad placed by Eric. And of course, says, no, we don't. What about Derek? No, we don't. I said, can you run a mobile phone number? And, and the young lass is like, yeah, I can put a phone number in here. So she types in the phone number, bang, ad. Handyman wants work. Almost identical wording to what he used when he produced the flyer that got him the job with him. Almost identical in wording. I couldn't believe it. I was blown away. So now, in my mind, 100%, this is Eric. So I decide that one of the first things that, that we want to do is, is head down to the, the Noosa Library and uh, get a copy of the archive newspaper and, uh, and also to check to see if maybe Eric had used the, the computer services there. And of course, I walk in the, in the front door with my, my workmate and he sort of wanders over to the magazine areas and I start talking to the young lass behind the counter and asking her to do all these checks for me. I was just hoping you could do an internet booking search for me. I mean, now, you've got to remember, I'm like, I look like rubbish. I've got a, a dodgy old shirt on, I've got a pair of boardies on. You could have been using the computers here over the last few months. Now I'm trying to say that I'm a detective investigating. At the time, Queensland's most wanted criminal. She's sort of looking at me oddly, look, oh, OK. So she does some heaps of work for me. She's on the computer, banging away, and she's going through internet booking records, and she can't find anything under Eric's name or, or an alias or anything like that. So I go, well, could you please just get me an archived newspaper? Okay, yeah. So she goes, yeah, OK. So off she wanders. So I'm just standing there and the next thing I hear the front sliding doors of the library open and of course as we all do when you hear a noise you turn and you look and I turn and look and here's a bloke wearing a Noosa t-shirt, a pair of shorts, pushing a pram with a nine month old kid in it walk through the front door and I was like oh my gosh Eric I'm just staring at him. My mouth's open, I'm like, and he walks past me, and I follow him as he walks past me. And as he walks past me, I look at his earlobe, and there is the cut, the scar on the bottom of his ear, which positively ID'd him straight away to me. And I look at my mate across the way, and he's staring at me thinking, oh, why are you looking so odd? And I'm like, that's him. In a bizarre twist, after a 406-day manhunt, Detective Aaron Ottaway had just spotted Queensland's most wanted man in, of all places, the local library in Noosa. And I was like, oh my gosh, Eric. That's him. And Eric goes around the bookcase, but he really goes around the bookcase so that he can sneak a bit of a look back at us. But we're already walking towards him. And I walk straight up to him and I go, G'day, Eric. Eric. And he's like, looks at me. I said, oh, Eric, from the Gold Coast. And he said, in a perfect American accent. I'm not Eric. He said, no, my name's not Eric. And I said, yeah, you're Eric Sokolowski. I said, you're Queensland's most wanted criminal. And again, in a perfect American accent. No. I said, it's you. I said, I've been staring at pictures of you for weeks on end. I said, you are Eric Sokolowski. I said, give me some ID. So he pulls out his wallet pulls out some ID, hands me the ID, and on that ID was Derek McLeod, the alias that he got the phone number on. And I went, gotcha. And he went, in his Polish accent. You got me. Yeah, you got me. And that was it. That's how we caught him. 
Everyone knew I was invested in this job like it was no secret. And I was uh, sitting in an internet cafe and I opened up my email and that just hit me in the face. Eric arrested, which was I think three days after I left. So I, ecstatic, yeah, very, very satisfied. So after more than a year on the run, Eric Sokolovsky was finally in custody. But what Eric would go on to confess in this actual police interview would be a bizarre tale involving the mafia, a drug run gone bad, and a $2 million debt. They said to me that was cost $2 million. So that's yeah. how much they reckon you owe them? Yeah. OK, all right. So you'd made a phone call to your mate, and he'd been beaten up. Yeah. And then you, and then, is that when you decided to take Andor's boat and stuff? I just was thinking, I got to do something, give some money. OK. Otherwise, they're going to do something on my ex-wife. And, to Harry. Mm -hmm. That's your son, is it? Yes. Yep. And then what did you do with all that property? What, where did you put all? Everything was on the boat. Yeah. And then what happened once you put it all on the boat? That guy told me, I gotta go to the abandoned market. So a plan was hatched to hand over the boat and the millions in stolen goods in Vanuatu. But Eric claims he struck engine trouble. And I was drifting like this for a day. Four days. Yeah. Out. Yeah, just so you know, floating. And I didn't know what to do. I tried to tease that radio, but no one answered. There was full tank of that uh, petrol for the thing. He said, maybe I can make a hundred kilometers on that, and then maybe I can cut some fishermen. Mm -hmm. So I just jumped on the dinghy and go straight to the land. How many days were on the dinghy? Uh, a week. And one day, I wake up, I was so tired. It was, it was really rough. Turn upside down the thing. Wait, that the uh, engine outboard go down, just sunk. I put that boat, the thing in the water, jump in it, and I just was staying there for a whole week. And where did you land? In the brunch. Brunch, okay. So what actually happened to the North Point? The boat? I left that pond. So, floating? Yeah. And that's it. To this day, the North Point and the stolen goods have never been found. And in another cruel twist, the Doors only received an insurance payout of $209,000 as Eric had access to the key and was deemed by the insurer an invited guest. You know, we, we did solve the case. We arrested Eric but we didn't get justice for Ian. We didn't recover his property. So you take a bit of personal frustration that does play in the back of your mind. Well, it changed our lives because, you know, financially, it changed our lives dramatically. It, it hit them hard. It really did have an impact. Um, you know, they, they are very proud people. And, um, and so, yeah, the house went, the business. So they took a financial on them and emotionally I mean they're a resilient couple as a husband and wife but you know emotionally he has to reinvent himself and it annoys me that I've worked so hard for my life and done so many things to and was once very wealthy um, yeah I mean it's a bit bit of a, a pill to swallow isn't it you know but that's life and yeah you know, trying to keep positive and Cunning, cunning, yeah. Like, like animal cunning. I don't put him as intelligent, but he's cunning. He knows people, or s certain types of people, and he plays on that. Eric is believed to be living in Spain, helping the elderly with their computers. 